Yo, yo, yo. Welcome back to another episode of Island Spot Sports. And before we get to our guest today, we have a big shout out for, for Living Sisu. Living Sisu is a platform and app that wants to give you all the tools to have success in your sport. Their main objective is to activate your lifestyle. So for active, it's for active people. Enjoy discounts at, at companies like BioSteel, 30% off, BodyLogics, the Goalie Guild, all his books are discounted. Roan, Lululemon for men, 20% off. Online stretching programs with Eccentrics, one full month free. They got super silent massage guns, 20% off those. And it's a great quality. It's way less expensive than a Theragun. And it's a great, it's great quality. So there's so many more discounts that you guys will need to just become a member to see. So they want to provide you with anything you need for success. So come join the community. I'm a part of it. A bunch of other athletes are a part of it. So it's free to join. It takes 20 seconds to have it, to get exclusive offers to your sport. And it's definitely worth worth it. So do do us a huge favor and go sign up for Living Sisu's membership. It's free, 20, takes 20 seconds. So go do it and we'll see you there. Living Sisu is a great company. We uh we know one of the co-founders, Zach Fricali. He's a great guy. He uh he's the co-founder and he does a lot of live streams on Instagram at uh, at Living Sisu and with a bunch of elite athletes and you learn a lot from like the athletes determination, the resiliency, everything to what me made them become successful. So it's been a great experience so far. So Go on. I'm going to leave uh, the link in the description. So uh, go sign up. Yo, welcome back to another episode of Honest Bot Sports. I'm Jack. In today's episode, we are joined by a very special guest, current professional goaltender, JP Lamaru. JP is a current professional hockey goaltender in the Ice Hockey League with the EC Salzburg. He played this past season with the EC Salzburg as well as the year prior, and he's playing there as, again this year. And he's in his third year there, so he's he's been there for a while. So it's good to get him on. But he played junior hockey in the USHL with the Lincoln Stars, along with playing NCAA Division One hockey for four years with University of North Dakota before turning pro, and playing in the ECHL and the AHL for three seasons before going overseas in the EBL. So this is gonna be a fun episode, JP. So welcome to the show, JP Lamaru. Jack, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. So how, how are things with you? How have things been going for the season? I know we talked a little bit off off air about your about what you're dealing with injury wise. So but like how's everything going besides that? Yeah, well, well first off, we're excited to be back in Salzburg. Uh it's one of the premier clubs, I think, to be a part of in Europe. So I've been over in Europe for over 10 years now. And uh we're this is an organization that we've kind of, my, my wife and I've always kind of had our sights on. So we're excited to be back here, but um, yeah, for, for me, uh, I'm kind of in new waters right now. I'm uh, on, uh, on the mend, uh, tore my ACL actually in our first uh, CHL champions hockey league game and uh, somewhat unexpected, but um, it's going to be about a 10 to 12 week injury for me. So I'm kind of right in the middle of that uh, recovery process and just trying to kind of get back, uh, hopefully mid season and rejoin our group. Um, we got a good young team here in Salzburg and we feel like we're going to be competitive again for another league championship. Yeah, for sure. It's like, what has been like the recovery process for you since you got this injury and like, how are you dealing with this since it's like your first long-term injury? Yeah, so uh, entering my 14th season pro, and uh, I haven't really sustained a, a long-term injury before. So, uh, but for me, the 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 lucky thing about my injury is that there wasn't a complete uh, rupture uh, with my ligament, and so I was able to avoid surgery. And the plan of attack from our team doctors was to do uh, PRP shots, which is platelet-rich plasma, and they actually inject that into your knee joint and then that's going to help uh the kind of the regeneration of the of the ligaments so it's going to be uh like i said it's a slow process um waiting and kind of patience is kind of the the biggest virtue i'm trying to practice right now and um and then just getting stronger in the weight room and then the the gradual progression of uh strength and then multi-directional movement then jumping and then and then finally getting back onto the ice so like I said, in the middle of that process and uh, 
uh, looking forward to getting back on the ice. Yeah, absolutely. At least you're you're being patient, not rushing it too too fast, where you can re-injure yourself, which which is a problem with with some with some players when they want to get back, they rush themselves way too fast, and then end up re-injuring themselves. So at least you're taking your time and making sure that the doctors are like the lead force and telling you what to do. Yeah, through the process, I've I've really had to lean on our training staff for what I can and can't do because, like you said. Uh, I think with an injury like this, like it's, it's a little bit disheartening because it's not actually overly painful, but uh, there are certain movements uh, specific to goaltending where, I, you know, I can't get into certain positions right now, but, uh, but just making sure that I'm not putting myself in a vulnerable position to where, you know, we're halfway through this recovery phase and then I do something silly in the weight room and, and then that sets us back again. So um, just being patient and, and, and I'm really kind of putting my faith in our, in our training staff to, uh, to get me back. Yeah, absolutely. Recovery is key. And it's it's a great time to recover and just like rest your mind as well, even though it's just the beginning of the season. Like you just gotta, gotta be patient, like rest your mind and make sure that you're ready to go when you're, when you are able to get back on the ice. Yeah. So one of the unique things is, you know, I'm an older player on the team. So, uh, you know, it, you, I'm all of a sudden kind of thrust into a role I wasn't expecting, but just trying to take advantage of, okay, I'm, I'm still at the rink every day. How can I still contribute to the team? Um, our, we had a young goaltender that I was kind of thrust into the starting role. So how can I support him through, you know, for him, it's an exciting opportunity and just making sure that I'm trying to be a good mentor and, um, be supportive, you know, not, you don't, I think the worst thing is, uh, you don't want to be overbearing as a goalie partner as well. So just trying to strike that balance and then, um, trying to, you know, I've been keeping stats, uh, for our team during our home games and just trying to find ways I can contribute. Um, and just making sure I'm carrying a good attitude at the rink and, and still being uh, interactive with, with, uh, with the teammates and stuff. So um, a lot of intangibles that, uh, you know, that, that I talk about in our, in our goalie schools in the summer, um, trying to put into practice right now. Yeah, for sure. That's, uh, that's great that you're able to still be at the rink and be, be around the team. And then you're putting what you tell your, your students in the practice right now, like that, that's all you can do during this time. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, you know, no one's going to feel sorry for you through the kind of through the rehab process. So I think if you're an athlete that uh, you're starting to dwell on things that you can't control, it's a, it's kind of a bad route and uh, negative thoughts is going to kind of breed negative uh, actions. So I'm just trying to stay on the positive things. And if I feel like I'm getting off track or sulking or feeling bad for myself because I'm not coming back as quickly as I'd like, you know, I try to just try to remind myself of those things. So. Yeah, always stay positive, even though things might not be going right. Like just having that positivity and mindset, like it it helps a lot, and you're able to just not get down on yourself or down on anyone. Just stay, just be happy and stay uh, stay positive. Yeah, ultimately, all you can do is control what you can. So. Yeah, exactly. So I want to get into your junior and college career a little bit here before we go full full on pro. So uh, can you give our viewers a little background information on yourself, like when you started playing hockey, teams you played on, like why you became a goaltender? Yeah, sure. So I, I grew up in Grand Forks, North Dakota, and I'm from a pretty big family. I'm the oldest of six kids. Um, we all ended up playing Division One college hockey, and a couple of my brothers played professionally too. Uh, one brother that uh, was coaching the USHL last year, and then obviously everyone knows my, my sisters who were uh, the Olymp on the last U.S. women's Olympic team. Um, so really competitive household growing up, um, lots of street hockey, um, skating outside. So that's kind of how I grew up. Um, Grand Forks, we didn't have, uh, I would say, overly competitive uh, teams that you might get uh, from like the Minneapolis area. Or So I always felt like growing up in Grand Forks, uh, players of my age, we all, and we would go to the national festival tournaments, we kind of always carried a chip on our shoulder as we wanted to prove that we were as good as, you know, the, the kids from the cities or the kids out East and, and stuff like that. So, um, but I played a, a high school hockey in, in Grand Forks for two years. And then I was drafted by the Lincoln stars. And then, as you said, in the opener, I played in Lincoln for three years and was lucky to be part of a, a really good organization at the time. Um, Steve Johnson was our head coach and we were able to win, uh, win the national championship my second year there. 
and then was able to play with a lot of great players, a uh, handful of guys that got drafted in the NHL and a couple of guys that had uh, really good NHL careers. Yeah, absolutely. So you go into the USHL, you get drafted. It's like, what was like that draft experience? Like, did you like just get like a call and find, find out that you got drafted? Like, how did that draft, how did you get drafted? And like, how'd that go? Um, well, interestingly, I, Lincoln was never really on my radar. I actually went to training camp for the Waterloo Blackhawks and had a relationship with the coach there. And um, at the time, uh, a lot of players signed tenders. So it was like you, you could actually sign with a team before even getting drafted. And I think for whatever reason, they didn't end up tendering me and uh, they thought they could get me in the draft. But then Lincoln saw I was available and then uh, Steve Johnson, who's from, who is my coach, he's also from uh, Grand, from the Grand Forks area. He ended up uh, drafting me, but I'm glad it uh, ended up working out that way. There were two uh, other good friends of mine that were from Grand Forks in Fargo, North Dakota, and uh, we all went to Lincoln together. And uh, and it was kind of, uh, I think when you go, uh, you know, a big life transition, like going to play junior hockey and moving away from home, uh, having two close friends to, to make that jump with made the transition easier. Yeah. So like, what was that transition like going from being at home to being with a billet family and just like having those two guys with you to make it at least a smoother transition, but overall, like what was, what was it like living with a billet and just having to be on your own for the first time in, in your life? Um, I know for me, I couldn't wait to get out the door. I was really looking forward to the independence. Um, I think a lot of, you know, a lot of junior hockey players, I would imagine, have gone through the same thing. They can't wait to get yeah. out uh, on their own and kind of make start making their mark. And um, that was definitely my attitude. But when you throw two friends that you grew up playing with and uh, chasing the same dream together, it makes that transition easier for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So you go into your first year of juniors for the Lincoln Stars. It's like, what were your expectations going into your first year of juniors? Or do you just come in with the mindset to just go with the flow of things and whatever comes your way, you're going to be ready for it. Well, uh, you know, I wasn't really sure what was going to happen. That probably the first half of the season, they, uh, we started the season out with three goalies and, uh, the challenge with that is you don't really know where you're going to fit and you don't know where your playing time is going to come. Um, the returning goalie that was coming in was uh, a league all-star the year before. And then the goalie that was joining me was also from my hometown who was just coming off winning the North Dakota state title. And he was a Mr. Hockey winner. So, and a really accomplished goaltender. And then, so we're going to be battling for ice time. And we were basically going through a three man rotation for about the first two, two and a half months of the season. And, uh, and that was a challenge. I think it, I put a lot of pressure on myself was, you know, I really want to stay here. I don't want to go back to high school. Um, and so it was really thrust into, uh, uh, you know, controlling what I can, um, not still trying to be a supportive teammate because ultimately, you know, you're competing against guys and if they don't do well, that gives you an opportunity. So just trying to make sure you're, you're handling it the right way. And, um, I, I know I leaned a lot on phone calls back with my dad because he was a college goaltender and he was a reason why I wanted to be a goalie too. And so the, you know, those conversations kind of helped me. And since he went through a similar process at the college level, um, you know, that was able to help me that first year junior. Yeah, absolutely. You just got to control what you can control because you can't control everything. But once you control the controllables, like you'll 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 realize that, like, those are the things you got to focus on. And like whatever happens after that, like might not go your way. But as long as you control what you can, like it's it's going to work out some way. Yeah. And I think what, you know, over the course of my career too, what you learn is that if you're kind of hoping bad things happen to other people, they end up kind of coming around and kind of biting you in the ass. So it's, yeah. uh, you, you really got to strike that balance. Like you want to be competitive and obviously everybody wants to succeed and they want that, you know, we're, we're goaltenders here talking. So everyone wants that number one spot and it's tough to, uh, to attain that, but um, you know, going through the process of just trying to establish yourself, the best thing you can do is, hey, just control, um, you know, your uh, execution during the games. And then when you're, it's not your turn to play, how can I contribute to the team in other ways? Can I be supportive on the bench? Um, you know, can I, you know, whether it's uh, during TV timeouts, throwing the water bottle and the towel up for your goal that comes to the bench, you know, what, whatever the little things can be, but uh, the little things that end up being really impactful and 
Um, and it rubs off on the other teammates because ultimately what you want to do is be a goaltender that your teammates want to play for. Yeah, you want to bring bring your team together. And the, some of those little things are the ones that that make the most memories and like the closest the close team bond, like I guess you'd say, and just that you guys all trust trust each other and like you guys are all fighting for each other every every game. Yeah, and, and what you find too is that uh, you know you need your team to bail you out sometimes too. You know, yeah. Sometimes you don't have it or you make a mistake, and you know guys that really want to battle for you, they end up making that that split second play or um, you know whatever it is. And uh, it you know over the course of an entire season, because uh, you know hockey season's a marathon, it is uh, it, it comes back and and your teammate will always uh, help you out. Yeah, absolutely. So, like, what was that transition going from high school hockey to the USHL? Uh, I always remember to quote. So, when I was coming up from uh, making that transition, Brad Berry, who's actually the head coach in North Dakota right now, uh, he was a, an assistant coach um, when I was kind of coming up through the ranks in North Dakota. And he just said that the jump from high school to junior is going to be bigger from the jump from junior to college. So, just kind of having respecting the jump and just kind of almost being on edge about, okay, am I good enough to be here? Can I make it? You know, all those doubts that young players have when they make the transition, you know, I, I respected it. So I think I went into that season, like really prepared. Like I, I was ready for the adversity. I was ready for the struggle. And I think that kind of helped me, um, you know, when I was in that three goalie rotation for the first part of the year and, and um, trying to get off to a good start. And, and, and it, for me, I think I really earned the respect of our coaching staff in practice because I was ended up um, kind of going back in my memory. I, I was voted like most uh, committed or hardest worker, or some, something along those lines. And uh, I think it, it definitely started early in the season. So I was committed to working as hard as I could in practice. And I think it carried over to the games for me. Yeah, absolutely. So like, how do you prepare to uh, like face that adversity and just like face like some of the struggles you might your first year of juniors? Like, how do you go about that? And like, what, what do you say to yourself when you start to do start to feel that adversity coming and like, how do you get over it? I think just having systems in place for yourself. And the thing is, um, you know, what we try to teach at our camps in the summer is, you know, everybody's a different individual. So everybody else is going to respond different. And, and the thing is, is you can, you can prepare, but when you get punched in the face with adversity, uh, you're always going to be surprised for it. So when yeah. you're surprised, it's just making sure that you're able to kind of get yourself back on track and, you know, whatever that, that is with, uh, like you said, we've repeated a dozen times already, you know, controlling what we can control or, or just making sure that you have a good system in place for how you prepare for a practice and prepare for a game. And just knowing that, okay, when I come to the rank, these are the things that I'm going to do. And when I do those things, I'm going to be ready to play and I'm going to play well. Um, yeah. And then just having, you know, uh, good reset systems during the game. So, you know, I give up an early goal in a game. Am I able to reset and have, have a strong finish to the period so we can get out of the period only down one as opposed to down two or three. So just kind of having those systems in place, I think will help, uh, younger goalies or anybody who's listening to this, uh, who's, you know, getting ready for a tryout or something like that, um, help you feel ready for the moment. Yeah. So as a younger goalie, like, how do you, for like the younger goalies out there, like, how do you create a system? Like, what is the like importance to creating your own system? Like besides the fact that like it resets you when things, things go wrong, but like, how do you overall like create a, a good system? Um, well, you, for, you got to know kind of yourself and what your motivations are. Um, you want to be intrinsically motivated. So you want to be able to uh, put together a routine before the game that is almost a reward in itself that it helps you make you feel good. Because um, ultimately, that's what's going to last over time. If you're doing routines and it's just a grind to get through your routine, it's just it's not going to last. And mentally, yeah. you're just not going to be where you need to be. So you're going to have to go through that through a lot of trial and error, probably. And usually the, the rule of thumb that I try to use, if, it, if it's worked for you for the last game, try it again. And if something's not working, then ch change it up. You don't have to totally overhaul your, your routine, but um, just add or subtract one or two things and just see if it's impactful. Um, yeah. I think, you know, like I mentioned before, having a reset system, you know, that's a, a couple impactful words, whether it's, um, you know, you could use the word reset or you could, uh, 
I remember there was, there was a famous movie when I was in college called For the Love of the Game, and Kevin Costner is a pitcher, and he has this phrase that he says to himself on the pitcher's mound. It's called clear the mechanism, and it's obviously total nonsense, but when he says it to himself, he kind of locks himself into that zone, and he, all of a sudden he, the, the, the crowd noise disappears, and he's just focused on the catcher's glove. So just, you know, that's just kind of a, a, a broad example, but the, those are the types of things that um, goalies should experiment with, and that kind of gets you into the right uh, – right mindset um like you said for uh adversity in the games and then being able to put together a system to prepare yourself for those moments yeah absolutely it's like what what is your reset like when you get scored on i know you talked about this in other podcasts but like what what do you do to help help yourself help yourself reset and focus on stopping the next puck um well simple is always best for me um, I'm always either reminding myself, uh, either it's something technical, like just stay over the puck or, um, sight lines is a word that I like Just find your sight lines. So something, something like that to me means, um, traffic and people in front of me aren't going to phase me. I'm just focused on trying to find the sight lines. Um, you know, another one for me is just, uh, it's kind of more of a mantra, but, um, calm control and focus. So if I can be those three things, you know, I'm going to be in, in a good headspace and be in the moment. Um, I think one of the, the biggest challenges that young goalies face is they're, they tend to get result focused as opposed to process focused. Um, and that's a challenge. It's, it's really easy to say as a coach, you know, be, be focused on the process. But, you know, it's, it's human nature to care about the result, right? But yeah. if you can learn to uh, organize your mind and your thoughts through the process of preparation for the game and then for puck drop um, feeling organized with your thoughts and actions is going to help you be prepared for the big moments and, um, and keeping a, a consistent level of play. Yeah, absolutely. So throughout like that first year, you have a, you have a really good season, then you guys make it into the playoffs. So like, what was, what was that playoff run and just like getting that playoff experience, even though you only played in two games that season in the playoffs, like what was, what were those two games like and just gaining that experience for, for the years, for the next few years after that? Um, well, we had a good team and we felt like we had a good run. We actually, um, we actually had a, it was a historic playoff series in the USHL. Actually, we, uh, Every single game we lost. So we lost three games to one in, in a five game series and uh, we lost every game in overtime. And then the game two was the longest game in USHL history, which was about four and a half overtimes. And uh, I, one of the things you need um, in sport is you need kind of an adversary or somebody that you're competing against. And that season, you know, the, one of the goalies I've respected the most is uh, Bobby Gefford played the, he's an 83 birthday. He played world juniors and Providence college, St. Cloud state. And then, uh, you know, 10 plus years playing pro. And he is like the most competitive goalie I ever played against, but he was a guy that I played against in that game. And he made something, I think he, we lost the game four to three, but he had 77 saves out of 80 in that game and was just, was in a zone like I've never seen before. So he was, uh, it was really, big learning experience for me as an older goalie. He was goalie of the year in the USHL that year. And kind of Bobby showed me like uh, that you can take your game to a different level. Like I think in my head as a young goalie, I'm like, okay, this is a good level of goaltending. And he showed me that there's, you know, a whole other level you can get to. So um, that playoff run in particular is kind of where I learned. I'm like, okay, I can go into next summer. And I'm like, this is, this was the best guy in the league. And he played, made world juniors out of that and uh, just showed me that he, uh, that you can, you can play goalie at, at, at a totally different stratosphere. And um, that's what I learned from watching Bobby play. And we had a bunch of other great battles in college and pro against each other too. Yeah, that, that's awesome. So then you go in your second year in Lincoln where you have another very successful year where you went 22, seven and four. And you guys also won the Clark Cup championship that year. So, like, what was it like during that year and ending ending the season winning a Clark Cup? 
Yeah, you know, playoff adversity kind of teaches you how difficult it is to win in the playoffs. And I know with our core group in Lincoln there, we were really pissed off that we had lost that series to Cedar Rapids. And, you know, we knew what it was going to take. Like, it's uh, to win games in overtime in the playoffs, like uh, how difficult it's going to be. And uh, we ended up having a special one. We went 9-1 and one in the playoffs. And uh, we were a bit undefeated up until game two of the finals. We lost one game, but uh, we were able to close it out. And then be a, to be a big part of that playoff run was uh, really special. We had a, a great group, a really close-knit group of players. And, that was ended up being the last time Lincoln's won uh, the Clark Cup. Yeah, that that's awesome that you were able to be there for that last last uh, championship for Lincoln. It's like, what what was it like when the clock hit zero and you guys were you realized that you guys were Clark Cup championships as uh, in the USHL? Yeah, it's pretty surreal. It's uh, we, we we won the game on the road in Omaha. And then I remember my, my you know, our, a lot of our billets drove down for that game because it's a close commute from Lincoln. And um, we ended up winning uh, game four, five to one. Um, it was three to one going into the third. And we scored an early goal in the third period to make it four to one. And when it was four to one, it was that's when you start getting really excited. So there, but there's still lots of hockey to play. So yeah. I believe we scored. I less than five minutes into the third period to make it four to one, but just to kind of keep those nerves down and how close you are three goal lead. Uh, we ended up making it five to one. So, uh, to, to close it out, but yeah, really exciting moment. Um, you know, that was kind of one of the first years I really practiced, uh, visualization and kind of seeing your future and just that, that whole year with, with our group just individually and then as a, as a collective group, just visualizing like we're, we were going to win that year. So we were able to win the Anderson Cup too that year, which is the regular season championship. So it was, uh, it was a really fun, special time. Yeah, so like what, what did you learn about visualization, like visualizing that success that you find super important for younger, goal, young, younger goalies and even goalies that are like in college, college juniors pro right now and just like to envision that success? Um, well, I was introduced to it, two different forms. One, it was, uh, I started taking yoga classes with my mom when I was like 14 at like a YMCA and they would always end the class with like a guided meditation. So that was the first time I was introduced to like, okay, you're like sitting with your eyes closed with your thoughts. So that was number two. And then, uh, one of my hockey heroes was Eddie Belfour, who was a North Dakota goalie and just remembering, uh, him talking about on like a hockey night in Canada spot, um, just visualization process that he goes through. So it's, you know, somebody that you respect and it's always important to look for good models. And he was my hero and I started trying it and then trying it seriously and being consistent with it uh, when I got to the junior level. And, you know, it kind of just starts with um, learning how to set goals and then actually visualize what those goals look like and then creating a system in place to, to kind of go after those goals. So, um, yeah, that, uh, that was really exciting. It was a big confidence booster too, that, you know, if you're consistent and disciplined with the visualization process, you can really manifest a lot of, uh, positive outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. Would you vision, would you do visualization before you go to bed or would you just do it when you right when you wake up? Um, when I was in junior, I would visualize after my pregame naps at home. Uh, and then over the years, I've actually integrated it. I actually do it in the rink now. So I do it right before warmups. And I'm, 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 uh, I, I think the biggest thing for goalies who experiment with it is just making sure you find a place that you're comfortable where you don't feel distracted. Um, and I feel like for goalies, the sweet spot as far as time, because you, you tell someone to visualize and they kind of don't know what to do with that. They're like, do, okay, do I sit in my room for an hour and just think, and then what do I think about? Um, the, the most impactful thing I think for goalies is find a routine that takes you between three to five minutes, um, get really specific about things that you think about, and then make sure that those, that thought process is consistent through your routine. And um, like I said, if, if it, if that works out for you for that game, then keep going with it. If there are a couple of things that you would change, um, throw something in there, but um, the structure of the routine will be impactful. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's a great idea right there. And like, I've, I've done some visualization. It really does help when you get into games and like 
like situations happen like it really like helps you like settle the nerves down just lets you focus on the game and focus on stopping that puck yeah did you feel like you were calmer in the net yeah very I was so much more calmer and like I was like I I used to like get like a little more like frantic and just like it'd be like all over the place but like when I do visualization like it's just calm and you're just you're you're in control of what of your movements yeah that, there's a lot of studies on it so if well there's anybody wants to kind of research this on google but there's there's scientific research on it that it'll improve your reaction times by fr uh, fractions of a second um which for our position obviously like that's that's huge so um yeah i, I definitely encourage all all young goaltenders to at least experiment with it and see if it works for you yeah, absolutely. So then you go into your last year at Lincoln and you play in 50 games and you get gold, you get named goaltender of the year. It's like, what helped aid in that success and being named goaltender of the year? Um, I think for me, what I wanted to prove that year was uh, I wanted to be an outright number one. I wanted to prove that I could play every game. Um, the challenge was going to be we, we had lost everybody from our championship team and we were going to be kind of in a rebuild season. And it was, you know, there's some pressure. It's like, can you kind of repeat the prior success? And although we missed the playoffs, it was a successful season individually. And, uh, you know, I think being uh, any goaltender knows that when you're not playing on the best team in the league, uh, you're going to be challenged night after night. And I certainly was that year and um, was able to uh, work on a lot of different parts of my game that got me ready for college. Yeah, absolutely. So while you're also playing 50 games, like it take goaltending takes a toll on your body. So like, how would you, how would you recover well uh, throughout the week to help make sure that you got, you're ready to go whenever your next start will be the next weekend? I think uh, when I was in junior, I started developing a really consistent discipline, mobility and stretching routines. And I think for me, um, my mobility has kind of given me longevity in the sport. Um, and that's definitely evolved from 2001. But um, I think if you, if goalies can integrate some form of mobility, yoga, stretching, and then having some sort of activation stuff with, with the band work, um, you're going to really get a lot out of your joints and you're going to save yourself a lot. Cause, cause for goaltenders, you know, our, our hips and hip mobility is our livelihood. So um, if you can be consistent, put, like I say, put together a routine or a system that, you know, is, uh, makes sense for your practice and game day routine, you're going to get a lot of longevity out of your joints and avoid a lot of unneeded injuries. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So then after your time in juniors, you decided to go play college hockey where you decided to go to university of North Dakota. So like, what was the process like to pick UND as your school for the next four years? Um, for me, being the hometown kid like that was the, you know, that was my NHL and having the opportunity and be a goaltender to be taken seriously to come play there was, uh, was a dream come true. So uh, my process was, uh, it was interesting. I actually, my first visit was to the University of Minnesota. Uh, my two best friends from who I grew up with, they ended up committing there. So I think they thought that they could uh, get me to go there. I took Minnesota seriously, obviously. Um, but when, uh, basically North Dakota, uh, basically wouldn't take no for an answer for me. So, um, but that's ultimately what I, where I wanted to go anyway. And I'm happy that I, that I had went there. Um, I respect Minnesota for sure as one of the premier programs in the country, but, uh, ultimately my dream was to always play for UND. Yeah, absolutely. So like, what was it like being that hometown kid, like you said, and like, it's your NHL and like putting that North, North Dakota sweater on and just being able to, just be able to play there for four years in your in your hometown. Yeah, it, it was everything you, you can dream of um, to play in front of the sold out crowds um, to have uh, played with so many great players that that come through there. Um, ultimately, I, I kind of just wanted to to almost live up to the legacy that other people from Grand Forks. So the guys that I looked up to that were from my area were Jeff and Jay Panzer and Tim Scarproot and Tim O'Connell. These are all Grand Forks guys that won national championships and were really successful college players. And um, they're, you know, you, you want to carry on that legacy. So I wouldn't say it, it was uh, unnecessary pressure, but you, you, you just kind of want to make those 
players proud that they were there before and, and know that the program's in good hands. And, um, you know, and I got to live out my dream, you know, I was a, a you know, a two year, spent two year backup to Jordan Parisi. And then when it was my turn, my junior, senior year, I was a two year starter and was able to win a lot of hockey games and have personal success and, uh, playing a lot of big games because we're obviously a program like ours, we're always competitive, but, um, ultimately we, we never won a national championship, which is our biggest regret, but, uh, was able to be competitive. We went to four frozen fours and, um, was, you know, it was a dream come true. Like I said, it was like playing in the national hockey league. Yeah, absolutely. And you're, you're the hometown kid. Like there's nothing better cause you're from there and like you've grown up there. Like there's nothing, but no better feeling than being the hometown kid there. Yeah, and I just I, I had enough perspective too, where just how lucky it was to be at that program. Um, you know, they, they recruit globally, and for me to be able to be good enough to be thought of to come in there and play, and then not only that, just to come in there and be a player that was going to be an impact player, though it was a it was a dream. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so then you go into your first year of college at University of North Dakota. It's like, what were some of the struggles you faced during that first year at the collegiate level that you had to overcome? And how did you, how did you overcome those struggles? Um, you know, I think coming off being goalie of the year, you, you want to get the net right away. And um, being patient was, was difficult. Um, similar to my first year juniors, it was a lot of waiting. Um, I believe, I don't think I got my first start until week five or six. Um, had a, two good returning goaltenders and it was just trying to wait your turn and, and making sure that I was uh, um, executing and playing well when I got the chance. Um, but, you know, I had really good goalies in front of me who were, I think, a little bit more ready to play at the time, which kind of reflects in the, the minutes that I got. Yeah, absolutely. So like, how, what do you do during those times where you have to be patient? You're not getting the starts. Like what, what do you do at practice to like, just, help the coaches know that you're engaged with practice and you're just working as hard as you can till you get that opportunity in your, in your third year going into going into your junior year. Um, you know, practices at North Dakota were really competitive. I mean, there's a new lineup chart, uh, sheet every single game or sorry, every single practice. And, uh, if they feel players are playing better in a certain practice, you get elevated in the lineup and practice. So, there's actually jostling with the goalies. And if you were the number one on Thursday, that means you got the first start on Friday. And so it was really competitive. Um, it was just trying to get out on the ice early for practice, take whatever extra you could. And really just, um, for at least for the goaltender position, uh, for Jordy and I, uh, it was a healthy competition in practice. Uh, we were ultra competitive, wanted the net, um, wanted the puck. And it was... Uh, I think it elevated both of our performance. Yeah. So like when you did get that first start of college, like what was that first first college game like and just getting that experience of playing NCAA Division One hockey under your belt? Uh, it, it was exciting. It was I remember my first start was on the road in Mankato. And uh, I think what made the start a little more special was uh, David Backus was playing for Mankato and we were teammates in Lincoln together. So um, that made the start a little bit more fun and wanting to get that first college win against uh, a, a former teammate is always a bonus. So uh, we ended up winning that game three to one and it was uh, it was a special night. Yeah, absolutely. So then you go into uh, your second year where you play in 14 games, you played 18 games your first year, 14 games your second year. Like what was that second year like and just being able to also gain that experience and just being able to to play a little bit more? Um, I think regressing in games played was, was tough. Um, it was uh, a slow start for me that year. My first three, four starts weren't, weren't really great. And so uh, it took a while for me to get back into the net. Um, I know I, I didn't really get um, back into the net that season um, through injury. So Jordy was injured for a couple weekends. So I actually ended up getting um, some big starts in Alaska Anchorage and I split that series and it was uh, a really tough Friday night start. And then I was able to follow it up with a shutout. Um, but if Jordy hadn't been injured, I don't think I would have got the Saturday start. So it was really just making the most of your opportunity. And, um, you know, the team needed me to step up and have a big game. And uh, I was able to parlay that to uh, being able to start a weekend series in Minnesota. 
and that was kind of a big turning point for me personally in the uh, uh, in the season to get a few more starts and play in important games for our team. Yeah, for sure. And like whenever you get those opportunities, you got to take it to you got to make the most of it and just perform, perform well, because you don't know how often those opportunities are going to come by. Yeah, and with the college game, with how short the, the season or it's not necessarily that the season is short, but there's few games played. It's uh, if, for the goaltender position. It's it's so crucial that you make the most of each weekend and it's only two games a weekend and um, you might only get one start. So just making sure that you're you're primed and ready. Yeah. So during that during that season, you guys ended up being the WCHA champ, a uh, regular season champion. So like. What was that experience like being being uh, WCA, WHCA champion? Um, it was uh, it was exciting. Uh, Wisconsin was actually ended up winning the national championship that year, but we were between us and Minnesota and Wisconsin. It was just like a it was just a slugfest all season in the regular season that year. Um, but we ended up beating uh, St. Cloud in the in the finals that year, and kind of I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, Bobby Geffert was the, uh, was the starter for St. Cloud and he had just an amazing playoff run for them to, to get there. And so, uh, um, I didn't get to start in the games, but, um, Jordy, our, our other goalie was MVP of the, uh, of the tournament and was outstanding for us. Um, we were able to get that win. So that was, that was special. And then to do it at XL energy center where we had 20,000 people in the building was, was great. Yeah, that must have been unreal because you're playing at the XL Energy Center and like there's probably the the stadium's probably filled. So like the energy must have been there and the atmosphere must have been unreal. Yeah, it's uh, looking back, it's the, the best hockey atmosphere I ever played in was Final Fives at uh, XL Energy Center. And then uh, we were able to play Minnesota a few times in some of those. And those were the, the best, most exciting, fun hockey atmosphere I've ever been a part of. Yeah, absolutely. So then you go into your junior and senior year where you get that opportunity to be that number one where you started in 37 games, your junior year, 42 in your senior year. So like, what was it like getting those opportunities and just being able to take that number one role and be able to to play a ton of college hockey games those two years? Um, well, it wasn't really a great start the junior year. Um, I think well, I had mentioned it earlier in the, in the interview, but I was definitely more result focused than process focused yeah. and put so much pressure on myself to, like I said, be the number one and be the reliable goaltender. And um, there was just so much uh, internal energy that was put into the result that I had zero control over. And, uh, and then I just showed in, in, in the struggle to the start of that season, our, our team was actually under 500 at the Christmas break. And so we had a huge hill to climb um, to get to the national tournament that year. And then we ended up coming back from that break. And then myself, I had to reset. And uh, we were able to put together an 18, two and two record to finish out the year. And that was able to get us into the national tournament. And, uh, and it, was a, it was a huge learning curve for me, you know, really set in stone, be process focused, not result focused. Yeah. So like, what was that learning experience like in being, in being process folks instead of re result folks and just being able to switch that, switch that knob from, from, uh, from that. Yeah. Well, when you take that time to kind of reflect on like, okay, I'm really struggling right now. What, what are the kind of the reasons for that? And it's just, Hey, I'm putting a lot of internal pressure on making on the winning and, when I'm getting into the big moments of the game, what am I worried about? Am I thinking about, are we going to win or lose? Or am I just thinking about making the next save? And uh, I think when, you know, when the pressure's on and, and the spotlight is on you and you're the one that's expected to, to beat the difference, um, that's the challenge. And um, the, the easiest advice to give is usually the, the hardest advice to take. Uh, personally and for me it was just you, you go through a half a season of struggle where you're just not where you want to be and you have to make internal changes and then for me I was able to to do that um, you know we as a collective group as a team too we were able to to turn the page and and I think play a more responsible game too but um, but yeah it was uh, it was a huge massive learning season for me yeah for sure so then you go into your senior year 
where you play in 42 games and you make a name for yourself and eventually get get signed into the ECHL the following year. So, like, what was that senior year like and just being able to get your name out there for pro hockey? Um, you know, that senior year was we were on a mission and we wanted to win a national championship. And it was kind of taking, you know, that learning curve from the junior season into the senior year and putting it together for a whole year. And I really felt like our group did that. Um, and yeah, it earned me an opportunity at the, with the St. Louis Blues organization and, uh, was really, uh, I was excited for where I went, but I was kind of expecting, um, a better opportunity at the American league level. And I quickly learned that, uh, nobody cares. <laughs> no, nobody, nobody cares what you kind of do in college. And, um, and then everybody that's signing pro contracts, everybody's really good. And so you might have an idea of where you think you should be or where you should start. And that's not always the case, but I think luckily for me, I went to a good organization. Um, I got a chance to play a ton of games in Alaska. Um, and looking back, it was one of my funnest seasons of pro hockey. We had an awesome group. We had a team that went all the way to the finals and, um, you know, I really enjoyed the, the city and, and the group of guys that I played with. Yeah, absolutely. So like you said, you went to the East Coast Hockey League with the Alaska Aces that next year where you played in 51 regular season games and 21 playoff games. Like what was like your biggest secret to finding that success in your first year and having it translate to every year of pro ever since then? Um, just I think uh, the growing pains of that junior season and then really finding out, OK, these are the important values that are going to um, prove success long term and then trying to systemize that and for me it's uh just always trying to get back to what my process is day to day things that are controllable um and then kind of trying to maintain your your thought process throughout the game um and i, I know i've been fortunate like you you can't have longevity without being surrounded by great people and i've just been yeah. lucky that i've been able to be part of great organizations, had a number of tremendous coaches, um, goalie coaches too, that have given me, passed on their wisdom that they have. And that's been impactful to me. And um, so a lot of self-belief, but, you know, being surrounded by good people and organizations uh, helps a lot. Yeah, absolutely. So that year you said like, that was the most fun season you've had at pro hockey. It's like, what, what made that season so much fun besides having all that success? Um, well, the cities we got to travel to were a lot of fun. So in those days, um, you know, we had Las Vegas, Phoenix, Salt Lake City. Uh, we had a California swing through. Um, let's see here. Bakersfield, Stockton. Um, Fresno got axed from the league midway through, actually. They were on the docket. But uh, Victoria was a great spot. Victoria, British Columbia, um, uh, just, just a lot of great cities. But um, I think be also being that young, not a lot of responsibilities or dependence yeah. yet. So that, that helps out. And, um, you know, and you're starting out in your first year, you're, you're got big goals, big ambitions. And, you know, this is the start of it. And, um, you know, that, that plays into it. And um, I think just, when I got settled in Alaska, I was really grateful to be there. So I think that played a part too. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And like how, how you're able to settle, settle down in Alaska and just be able to have fun that year. And like you end up winning goaltender of the year that year. It's so like, how, how special was it going into your first year and then coming up with a goaltender of the year? Uh, turning pro, you, you never really know where you're going to, where you're going to fit. But um, I was just fortunate that I was in a, Go to good organization where a team was was really good, um, and then I was in a spot where I had a coach that believed in me that was going to ride me, and that meant a lot to me. So um, I felt like I had a lot to prove. An undersized goaltender, you want to make it prove that you can play and you belong at a higher level. And um, you know, I was just on a on a mission personally that hey, I, I deserve to be at the, at a higher level, and I'm going to prove that I I think I'm one of the best in in the league. Yeah, and you uh, you then go into the AHL the following year. But before we hit the AHL, you you go on an incredible 
21 game playoff series where you guys end up going all the way to the finals. Like what was, what was that playoff run like? And just being, just everything that you learned from that, from that playoff run, especially going all the way to the championship. Um, well, t- I mean, to this day, it was the most hockey I've ever played in a season. So 72 games and, um, the, the playoff run was, it was surreal. It was just, it was so much fun. Um, like, like our team was just collectively on, like on a mission. We were, uh, I think we went five and one, five and one, four and oh, and then lost in game seven of the finals, um, in a tough series with South Carolina. And, uh, we were down three to one in that series and we were actually able to win an overtime in game, uh, five to bring it back to Alaska for game six and seven. And, um, but we're able, ultimately lost in game seven, but just, uh, just a lot of fun playing hockey. Uh, all guys that were just committed to winning a championship had a, a unbelievable, uh, fan base in Anchorage that was supporting our team. And, um, you know, some veteran guys that are able to set the tone that, you know, they, uh, made sure that the younger players knew like, Hey, this is a special time, special group. Let's make the most of it. So, um, and then what, one of the special things was uh, we beat Las Vegas in Las Vegas to go to the finals and we were able to have a good night out after that too. So that kind of made it, uh, made it a memorable oh, part of the. Boy, you, you got it. You're in Vegas. Like what, what else you could, what, what else do you have to do in there? Yeah. East coast per diem. Going, going crazy. Yeah, absolutely. So then the following year, you spent time in the American Hockey League playing 31 games with the Portland Pirates. Like, what was that transition going from the East Coast to the American League? Um, well, again, it was just a kind of a slap with reality. You know, I've come, uh, thought I would get a, a good opportunity to play a lot in Portland, but, uh, you know, I was basically assigned to be Jonas Enros back up the whole season. And, um, you know, and that was, that was a tough adjustment. Um, I don't think I handled it as well as I should have being the backup. I think I, I, I could have played more productive minutes for sure. Um, and I didn't really get a lot of starts till the end of the season when Jonas, Jonas ended up missing the last six weeks of the season with a high ankle sprain. So I got a lot of my starts at the end of the year, but, um, but, you know, I, I learned, I, I had to learn how to be a better backup and have better productive practices with an American league schedule. And, uh, And then, so when I got back in the summer, I was like, okay, these are the areas where I really struggled during the season. And with my next uh, contract, I was going to be better prepared for, for playing that role. Cause I knew I was going to be kind of more of a, a a one B at best, but third, third guy in the depth chart in the, in the American league. Yeah, absolutely. So like, how do you, how do you come to reality with like not being the greatest backup and then like trying to change to being that good teammate, that good backup that, that you want, that you want and that you should be as a, as a backup in the AHL? Well, for me, the adjustment was the the practice schedule and the practice reps that you got with the amount of games you played wasn't, wasn't great for, for our organization, at least in when I was in Portland, like we, we didn't have a goalie coach and, the practices that we had, they weren't really great for goalies. So it was trying to figure out ways under like through that system and that daily routine is like, okay, how can I get some reps that are going to help me feel good about my game? And so that, that's what I really tried to take away from that year was, okay, if I'm in this situation again, these are some drills. These are some things that I can do that can em, uh, empower my game and make me feel confident um, and be, and be ready to play. And I think I handled it way better um, my year in Abbotsford where I ended up playing off the bench quite a bit that year. Um, and even though I only play, I played less than 20 games, but even though I, I didn't play a lot, my production was, was a lot higher than it was in Portland. So. Yeah, that, that's at least, uh, that's at least uh, an improvement from that year prior. So then that year you spent time in both the ECHL and the AHL with the Utah Grizzlies and the Abbotsford Heat. So like, what was that year like for you going from the ECHL to the AHL and playing off the bench quite a bit in Abbotsford? Uh, the challenge that year was just, there was just no certainty at all. It was, uh, I was going to have stints in Utah. I was going to have stints in Abbotsford and I didn't know when I was going up or down. So really living day to day. Um, it was, uh, it was a challenge, um, from, 
organizing your life away from the rink to, okay, I'm, I'm with a new team. Uh, how, how am I going to fit in with the lineup? When am I going to get my next start? Like, all, you know, all these questions that are happening pretty regularly. So, um, but going through that year was, I knew I wanted more stability in my life. And uh, I got some advice from a, a respected goalie coach who was a, had a big impact on me. And he kind of recommended me to try to go play in Europe and that I could uh, have a really good career over in Europe. So after that season, that's, uh, that's what I opted to do. Yeah. So like, what is your mindset when like you don't have that certainty and you don't know if you're going to get called up or sent down. It's so like, what goes through your mind throughout all this and just having to live day to day. It's man, it's, it's, it's living literally is just 24 hours. Okay. I'm just going to get through this day and have a good day at the rink get my body feeling good. And if I'm playing in Utah, I'm ready to play in Utah. If I got to get on a plane and go play in Abbotsford, then when I get off the plane, I'm going to be ready to play there. Um, make sure that you always have a bag packed because uh, there's always guys who get called up and then you never have any clothes. So it was always like making sure you at least had a game suit and something that was, that was ready to go right away. But um just a, a lot of, a lot of different things. I remember my uh, girlfriend at the time had to mail me some clothes when I was in Abbotsford because, because I, I think I had only had, you know, three different pairs of clothes and I was ended up being there for over a month. So um, those are the type of things that you got to go through. I'll always got to have the extra suitcase somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So then you take your, you take your game to year up the following year. It's like, what was that? What was that time in Europe going, or that first year, like in Europe, and just going over there, and like that transition from North American hockey to the European ice? Um, well, the game kind of suited my my game a little bit better. Uh, a lot of east to west, a lot of broken, a lot more broken plays. Um, gonna see a lot of shots. <laughs> um, that that's kind of the game over here, but. Uh, but yeah, it, it was a challenge. I mean, it was just that that first season was just try to get over here. It was, you kind of almost look at it like an investment season where nobody knows you in Europe. They don't know anything about what you did in college or junior. So it was, okay, I got to put up a good season and then, you know, maybe it'll get me an opportunity somewhere else. And fortunately uh, that's what happened and ended up moving on to VLOC for four years and uh, made a really good relationship with a, which in my opinion is one of the best goalie coaches in Europe, Marcus Kirschbaumer. And we developed a, a great relationship and I really felt like I was able to uh, continue to develop my game um, playing for him in, in VLOC. Yeah, so like what was that transition like going or that adjustment going from now from getting shots in the AHL and the ECHL to getting a ton of shots in, in Europe? Yeah, it's just the, the style of play is um, a little bit different. Uh, the, on the bigger ice, the European teams tend to want to play more of a puck control game, re, a lot of regroups in the neutral zone. Um, although now I would say there's so many more North American coaches that are come over, coming over here that you're seeing a lot more north-south hockey, um, trying to play a fast game. But um, you tend to see more broken plays. There's um, – a mixture of veteran players from the American league and East coast league and young European players. So there's an interesting mix of, of players. Um, but just a lot of really good hockey players that people back in North America would just have never heard of. And that's kind of a, kind of one of the, the secrets over here is that there's a lot of really good players over here that people just don't get to see. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a, it's a lot bigger ice surface, a lot, a lot more room to make plays and just hit, just hold on to the puck and make make that perfect pass, perfect play. Like it, it must be a lot of like just doing it, just like play, just having having it be in your in your zone quite a bit. Yeah, it's more skating, it's more puck possession. Um, I would say I don't want to say that's more skilled than the NHL because the NHL players are so skilled, but um, you, you're just going to see a little bit more more skilled games, which ends up leading to more turnovers, more broken plays, which um, they're not great for coaches, but they're exciting for the fans. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, what was that culture shock like when you first went over to Europe and how, how you see playing in Europe now and like everything that you've experienced the past 10 years over in Europe? Um, 
you know, the, the first season was a challenge uh, when you don't speak the language and it's just simple tasks like, okay, getting everything I need at the grocery store to, uh, you know, how do I fill up my, my car with gas to, you know, you name it, where do I go eat at a restaurant sort of things. Uh, you know, those things are a culture shock at first, but you adjust. But, um, you know, we've, my wife and I, we've raised a family over here and, um, you know, we really feel like we've made a, a good life and we're happy that we had, had our two kids over here. They, they were both born in Austria and, um, and we, we've, we're really happy with our decision to, to come over here. And I know players that stay in the American league and, and do that grind. And I respect that, but I, I really feel like our, our balance of quality of hockey and quality of life is really high over here. Yeah, that's awesome. So then since going overseas, you played four seasons for VLOC, three seasons for the Vienna Capitals, where you won Ebel championship in 2016, 2017 there. And you're going on three years with EC Salzburg going into this season. It's like, what has that journey been like going from Vienna to VLAC to Salzburg? Like what's been your favorite part about playing in Europe? Um, just living in the Alps here. So we've lived in Austria for over 10 years and just uh, waking up every day, being in the Alps and living in this beautiful city, um, being part of this uh, great organization like Red Bull, where you really have every resource you could possibly want um, to be a better hockey player. It's, it's available to you, um, filled with great people. Um, you're surrounded by great players. Uh, there's so many hungry young players here in Salzburg that uh, want to be great players. So that's exciting. Um, you know, it re it uh, reinvigorates you as an older player um, to keep the love of the game and all that sort of stuff. But um, the transition was, you know, uh, I think Red Bull is kind of viewed as was one of the pinnacles. So we feel grateful that we were able to. to to continue to ascend and, and play at the, at the highest level um, over here in Austria. Yeah, absolutely. So you also throughout that time won a Ebel championship with the Vienna Capitals. Like, what was it like winning a championship in the Ebel and being in Vienna? Um, well, we loved our time in Vienna. The fans treat, treated uh, myself and, and our team uh, tremendously. Uh, we had a really special group that season. Our coach, Sergio Van, um, was a first year coach in Vienna and we really were a team that had the chip on our shoulder all year and had a kind of a historical run. We had, uh, the, we won the most, I think it was the most points in the regular season by any team. And then we went undefeated in playoffs, which uh, I don't know. I, I just, I can't describe it. Like you go, you want to think that you can win every game, but yeah. you're like, okay, we're going to lose at some point you know, cause it just doesn't happen, but to sweep the playoffs the way we did was, uh, it was really special. Like it'll be a historic team. Nobody will, will probably do that again. Yeah. That's unreal. And you, it's like, what was it like when the clock hit zero and you guys be, you guys were undefeated the entire season, the entire playoffs. And then you guys are holding the, holding the trophy in your hands. Uh, it was, it was pretty special to win it, uh, in Klagenfurt, which is, um, a really historic hockey town in Austria uh, was special for our group. Um, you know, just the, the, the culmination of the season, you know, you, you put in the work and then it really boils down to, you know, one final 20 minutes to close it out. And our guys were able to do that. Um, and then to share it with our team inside the locker room and, you know, to be part of the team pictures, it's, uh, it's the best. And then to, to share the trophy with the families um, afterwards, uh, it's uh, memories that we'll always remember. Yeah, that's awesome. There's no no better feeling than ending your season with a championship and holding that trophy over your head. Yeah, no question. It's it's the best. Yeah, absolutely. So you've been a top goaltender in every league in your pro career that you have played in so far. It's like, what is like your secret to that success and being a top goaltender every every single year that you play? Um, I think just for me personally, it's always been a strong uh, belief in myself. Um, but with that belief, you have to put in place systems and uh, work habits that allow you to achieve that day to day. So for me, it's I, I know I have to be a good goalie in practice to be a good goalie on the weekend. And for me, it's always been wanting to be the best practice player. So 
Um, simply put, I, I try to prepare as well as I can for each practice. And then just through repetition, I think I've improved skill sets. And then through the experience of having a long pro career, um, trying to have uh, mental systems in place that allow me to hit the reset button when I need to. And then when, you know, you have an off night or things don't go well, it's, you know, having the, the thoughts and systems in place to be able to get back on track fast. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a, that's a great, great secret to share for uh, your success. So uh, JP, I have a few more questions for you before we wrap things up here. So uh, do you have any tips for goaltenders looking to get to that next level? Um, yeah, I would just make sure that you, uh, at some point in time, you're going to have to start summer training. So finding a trainer that you trust and feel like you, uh, are getting stronger and that can identify weaknesses you as an athlete, whether that be flexibility, strength, or, or whatever it have, what, uh, whatever it might be for you. So making sure you have something that's, uh, consistent in the summer and then, you know, uh, finding a, a goalie coach that you trust that can kind of help you uh, honestly evaluate, um, your strengths and weaknesses as a goaltender, and then just having a plan in place, um, in your summer months to work on those things. And then you go into a season, uh, really confident. Um, and then just know that, uh, you're going to have, um, difficult times and you're going to be challenged in different ways, whether that would be playing for a team that's weak or having to wait your turn in the net. Um, uh, maybe feeling like you deserve more than what you're getting, um, you know, practicing patience. So you just, if you can prepare yourself for those moments and just feel like, Hey, I can, uh, I want to react as well as I can in those situations. Um, you're going to be confident and you're going to learn something from that season. Um, and then just, uh, can, that'll help you keep a huge, uh, sense of self-belief which is the most important thing because no one's gonna believe in yourself for you yeah that's those are some awesome tips and like just like the self-belief like if you don't believe in yourself what makes other people wanting to believe in you yeah exactly it's you know no one's gonna put the work in for you no one's gonna lift the weights no one's gonna do the summer skates for you you have to put in that work and when you do that you're gonna develop confidence yeah, absolutely. So my next question for you is, uh, what is like your mindset going into games and practice? I know you said you want to be, you want to be the best, best practice guy there can be. It's so, like, what is your mindset throughout those practices and just being able to have that mindset? Um, you know, with, in collaboration with my goalie coach, it's, you know, maybe focusing on one area of my game more than others, but, um, just finding different ways because obviously every drill in practice, it's not for the goaltender. Um, you know, sometimes we get in drills where we're not, there's not a lot of recovery time or there's a lot of shots back to back, but just finding ways to, um, you know, uh, just a, a brief example is if there's a drill where you don't have a ton of recovery time in between shots, just say, Hey, I'm just going to hold my edges this whole time, but I'm going to be really focused on having good hands and trying to make sure I'm catching or redirecting every puck. If it goes in five hole, I can live with that, but you know, with lots of re repetitive shots, just trying to make sure I have good hands. So just finding little things that, okay, I'm going to find a way that I can get the most out of this drill. And just as long as you're having that mindset, um, you're going to feel good about your practices. You're going to be productive. And obviously with the effort, your skill level is going to improve. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's a great mindset to have. And you're going to, you learn so much from that, especially just standing on your edges and just making sure that your hands are active because because your hands need to be active all the time, especially, especially going into like the butterfly or just standing up, like you need to have those active hands. Sure. So then my final question for you is, uh, what's been your favorite food that you've tried since, since going over to Europe 10 years ago? Oh, it's, uh, we're spoiled in Austria. They have such good food over here. Uh, you can't go wrong with a really good schnitzel over here though. Um, it's kind of one of the things when I, when we go back home, when we come back, I'm actually always craving one. So the, here in Salzburg, you can get a really good schnitzel over here. Uh, that sounds, that sounds so good, but uh, I think this will wrap things up. So uh, JP, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate your time. And I'm, I want to wish you the best of luck with your recovery from your injury and going into the, into the season when you're able to get back. And I look forward to following your career the rest of the way. 
Yeah. Thanks, Jack. Appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and good luck with the podcast. Yeah. Thank you.